Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Kravis, Physician Executive for 3M Consulting Services. Thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about ICD-10 documentation for radiology. There are some changes you will need to make in your documentation to support ICD-10, but there are instances of documentation that can remain the same. Let's get started. By the time we're finished, you'll have a clearer picture of ICD-10. I know you are busy in your clinical practice, so I'll briefly summarize the key takeaways. In your radiology documentation, consider the use of adjectives, link the cause and effect of conditions, be specific about aspects of disease, and each anatomical site, as well as laterality when appropriate. A little more on each of these. Differentiate in your report whether a condition is healing, old, severe, acute, and so forth, whenever appropriate. For example, document healing fracture of mid-shaft of left femur. Use due to or secondary to to indicate cause and effect such as pathologic fracture of femur due to malignancy. Think about the most current terminology to describe a condition or different aspects of the disease. For example, panacinar emphysema instead of emphysema when appropriate. ICD-10 codes have more specific anatomical descriptions than ICD-9. Precisely designate anatomical site such as embolism of middle cerebral artery or trimalleolar fracture of left ankle. Ask yourself what else could I add to my report that would better communicate the condition, disease process, or injury I am reporting on that would better communicate the resources needed for patient care. Incorporating these aspects into your documentation will result in an accurate picture of your patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. And it will help reduce the number of queries you will receive to clarify your documentation. In the upcoming slides, we'll take a look at some diseases and procedures that have new documentation requirements under ICD-10. In ICD-10, there is a feature called a laterality for right, left, and bilateral, which is found in many diagnoses and procedure codes involving paired organs, or those codes specific to one side of the body versus the other, for example, inguinal hernia. This feature of ICD-10 by itself is responsible for a substantial increase in the number of codes which you have probably heard so much about. Since you usually include this information in your radiology reports when applicable, additional documentation will typically not be needed. It's best to document this information as part of your diagnosis statement, such as fracture of the shaft of the left humerus or tear of the right meniscus, cyst of the left ovary, or carcinoma of the upper outer quadrant of the right breast. If you happen to omit laterality when needed, it may result in a query for you to clarify this in your report. Suffice it to say, laterality is included when appropriate for many of the areas of the body you may be examining radiologically. So do a quick double check of your report to be sure you included it before signing off. We'll try not to belabor this point in the upcoming slides. ICD-10 provides a unique seventh digit to identify the episode of care for which the injury or condition is being treated. These are initial encounter, subsequent encounter, or an encounter related to a sequela of an injury. An initial encounter is used while the patient is receiving active treatment for an injury. For example, a patient undergoing surgical repair of a fractured femoral neck. A subsequent encounter is used after a patient has received active treatment for the injury and is receiving routine care during the healing or recovery phase. An example of this would be a patient who receives a follow-up x-ray of the femur six weeks after surgical repair. Sequela is used for a complication or condition that arises as a direct result of an injury 
such as a patient diagnosed with traumatic arthritis of hip following a fracture of the femoral neck. I am making you aware of this new ICD requirement because you may get some questions about this from the coding professionals who are coding your radiology reports. ICD-10 codes distinguish between open and closed and displaced and non-displaced fractures. In some cases, unique codes are provided for the specific part of the bone fractured, for example, greater or lesser trochanter of the head of the femur. Fracture orientation should also be specified, such as green stick, transverse, oblique, or spiral. And of course, right versus left when applicable is also a required component. There is additional specificity provided in ICD-10 for fractures of the forearm, femur, and lower leg, as well as for physial and sacral fractures. Long bone fractures of the forearm, femur, and lower leg can be further classified in ICD-10 as type 1, 2, or 3A, 3B, or 3C, according to the Gustillo classification. Physio fractures are reported as Salter-Harris classification type 1 through 4. And lastly, vertical sacral fractures need the additional description of zone 1, 2, or 3, and whether they are minimally or severely displaced. Transverse fractures are reported as type 1, 2, 3, or 4, and so you must be precise as possible when recording your diagnosis of fracture. As discussed earlier, ICD-10 injury codes require a seventh digit to indicate whether an encounter is initial, subsequent, or sequela. The seventh digit character for subsequent care of fractures is more specific in that it indicates if the subsequent care is for a fracture with routine or delayed healing, or if a malunion or nonunion situation exists. Take a look on screen at these options. One of these healing statuses should be documented for all follow-up fracture radiographs. Long bone fractures of the forearm, femur, and lower leg have more specificity regarding the healing status by indicating if it was an open or closed fracture, and if open, it's Castillo's classification. The chart on screen reflects these options, so please indicate this information in your diagnostic statement if known. ICD-10 differentiates other injuries of the musculoskeletal system by type, such as contusion, laceration, dislocation, subluxation, sprain, and strain. In each case, additional detail should be documented for site and, in most cases, laterality. Take, for example, a sprain of the right ankle. Determine if you can further identify the specific ligament injured, such as calcaneofibular, deltoid, tibiofibular, internal collateral, or talofibular. If so, document sprain of right calcaneofibular ligament of the right ankle, for example, rather than right ankle sprain. What remains the same with cerebral infarction? The etiology of a cerebral infarction or stroke is still classified primarily by the cause or etiology, that is, whether it is due to thrombosis or embolism. What's new? ICD-10 has a number of new codes for cerebral infarction which identify the specific artery involved and, when applicable, whether it's the right or the left vessel. For example, you see here the codes for cerebral infarction due to thrombosis of the anterior cerebral artery. This is a good example of the anatomic specificity in ICD-10. So be sure to include in your report the artery affected and its laterality when appropriate. As with cerebral infarction, additional documentation that will be needed for patients with non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is the artery affected as seen here on the left. Documentation of sites other than the artery, such as parietal, results in a query of the reporting of a code that states unspecified intracranial artery. As seen here on the right, 
Non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage requires documentation of the actual anatomic site of the brain affected, such as the subcortical or cortical hemisphere. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 classifies myocardial infarction by type, STEMI versus non-STEMI. New in ICD-10 is the ability to report the site or location of the STEMI by coronary artery affected. If at the time of radiology exam you don't know the coronary artery, document as much as you do know, such as the wall of heart affected. Note that no additional documentation is needed for the location of non -stem. Here are the examples of ICD-10 codes for a STEMI. Note that the codes are first categorized by anterior or inferior wall, then additional specificity is provided for the coronary artery. Also note that certain terms crosswalk to certain codes. For example, a transmural myocardial infarction of the inferior wall is coded to other coronary artery. The key here is describing the MI with as much specificity as possible regarding the type and location in terms of the artery, wall, or other site affected. Most types of emphysema were grouped into a single ICD-9 code. What's new in ICD-10? Separate codes are provided for specific types of emphysema. If you are able to determine the type of emphysema, such as pan-ansoner, proximal, asiner, central lobular, and so forth, and document it accordingly, it will assure that a unique ICD-10 code for that condition can be reported. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about radiology ICD-10 PCS codes, which are codes used to report radiologic procedures. Let me clarify that these codes would only be used by hospital coding professionals for radiologic procedures performed on a hospital inpatient. You will still use CPT codes to submit claims for radiologic services you may provide to any patient, whether it is an inpatient or an outpatient. Even though you won't be reporting ICD-10 PCS codes for your services, it's worthwhile mentioning because there are some definite differences in ICD-10 radiology coding when compared to ICD-9, which may result in some queries from hospital coding professionals. We'll talk about some of the differences in the upcoming slides. The ICD-10 PCS radiology section is comprised of five imaging categories, which are plain radiography, fluoroscopy, computerized tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, and ultrasound. The fifth character of an ICD-10 PCS imaging code identifies whether a contrast agent was administered. Furthermore, if a contrast agent was used, it is identified as high or low osmolar. Take a look on screen at the PCS table for plain radiography of the urinary system. The contrast section has been highlighted. I mentioned contrast agents on the previous slide because the coding professional is going to be reviewing your radiology report to determine if a contrast agent was used. Since you typically include this information in your radiology report, additional documentation will not be needed. I recommend that hospitals prepare a formulary of sorts of the contrast agents they use in their imaging departments and identify each agent as high or low osmolar in order to assist the coding professional to quickly and easily identify the osmolarity of the agents used, which will ensure accurate code assignment. The ICD-10 PCS nuclear medicine section is comprised of six categories, which are planar nuclear medicine imaging, tomographic nuclear medicine imaging, positron emission tomographic imaging, non-imaging nuclear medicine uptake, non-imaging nuclear medicine probe, and systemic nuclear medicine therapy.
The fifth character of an ICD-10 PCS nuclear medicine code identifies the radionuclide administered during the procedure. On screen, you will see the PCS table for planar nuclear medicine imaging of the endocrine system with the radionuclide column highlighted. The coding professional will review the nuclear medicine report to determine the radionuclide administered to the patient. I know you include this information in your report, so the good news is that there are no new documentation requirements for nuclear medicine procedures. ICD-10 requires more detailed descriptions in your documentation of anatomical site, laterality, and aspects of a disease, injury, procedure, and circumstances of patient encounters. The information generated from ICD-10 codes will result in a more accurate picture of your patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality and the services rendered. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. Thanks for joining me. Should you have questions about documentation for a particular diagnosis or procedure, your hospital's clinical documentation improvement specialist should be your first stop. The coding staff in your health information management department is a valuable resource as well. Have a great day.